Well, brilliant. Welcome everyone to the Summerford Associates uh, podcast, technology podcast. And I'm really excited to have Lyndon Headley here um, from Confluent. Welcome, Lyndon. Yeah, thank you. So Confluent um, is a new partner of Summerford's. And what we've been finding is that it's it's so flexible. We wanted to have a conversation with someone inside of Confluent so that you can understand a bit better why you would use Confluent and Kafka. Um, so who better to ask other than the principal business value consultant in Confluent, Linden? So that's what this podcast is about. So if you've ever heard of Confluent or if you haven't even heard of Confluent, it'd be a good starter to start to visualize why you might use it. Is that a good summary, Lyndon? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, happy to talk and give some examples. <laughs> so in my head, I've got uh, like a big box in the middle, which is uh, Confluent. And I have lots of different data on, on the left-hand side, lots of diff disparate data sources that they don't usually come together. And then, but Kafka can cope with all of that and Confluent on top can help you feed it in and manage all of those uh, data flows. Um, and then you can take that data to anywhere you want. Like you can feed it into apps, you can feed it into the SIM. I, it's just really flexible, isn't it? So it's such a generic visualization. Is that the right picture I've got in my head? Yeah. The, so, so I can start with a bit of background maybe um, and the history of uh, Kafka and why it was developed. So mm -hmm. uh, it goes back to 2011 through to 2014. So LinkedIn was going through hyper growth um, through kind of global scale. And they were developing a platform that we all know and use probably. Um, that it was a real time platform that relied on data. And, and uh, the engineering team at LinkedIn was struggling with existing technologies. So when you look at the way software systems are architected with that, I don't know, kind of client server type architecture of you put lots of data into a static database and you query it. Mm. And as you scale out, you often need to kind of take copies of data and extract it and transform it, load it elsewhere, and then scale out to start processing data. Uh, I think LinkedIn were playing with new functionality like kind of um, connection recommendations or uh, targeted job advertisements and, and so on, which required looking at data, processing and, and responding in kind of real time to update a UI, a, a effectively a screen that was highly personalized to every individual within LinkedIn. Mm. Uh, and they were finding the existing technologies just weren't cutting it. So they were using ETL and messaging technologies. It was expensive to scale. It was falling over. It was not real time. So batch process, they were taking copies. They had multiple sources of truth of data. And they just figured there was probably a better way of doing it. And, um, and the uh, engineering team there, led by Jay Krebs, created something that ended up being Kafka. And, and they open sourced that to the Apache Software Foundation in 2014, I think, and, and created Apache Kafka, which then became freely available as an open source tool. And a lot of Silicon Valley, kind of West Coast, uh, uh, digital first companies started to use that as, as their primary way of managing large amounts of data at scale. And the key bit as well is that real time hook, isn't it? Yeah, so again, with kind of old school software architecture would often work with batch processing of data. So you'd get reports kind of, you know, every 24 hours or, mm. or whatever it was. I remember back in the day with bank statements, you know, you'd, you, every month. <laughs> and it, all the, these were all batch process data. But as, as things started to move to internet type, digital first type, kind of experiences that customers would expect, then you'd have to have real-time updates. And, uh, and of course, now we're totally used to everything being real-time. You want um, that kind of Uber functionality of ordering a car, seeing where it is, knowing how long it's going to take to get there. When you step in, you start a financial transaction that's in real-time. When you step out, you've paid the bill. That's This type of functionality 
requires a different way of architecting software. So you, you want to automate processes based on events as they happen. Uh, you want to remove the people from the process. You don't want to work in batched kind of ordered. Um, so, yeah, of course, kind of real time kind of serve most use cases. And I, that's how we work today. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Kafka, Apache yeah. Kafka. So then Confluent is is on top of that, though, isn't it? So it's not the open source bit. Although you can yeah. use some of it for free, can't you? Um, but, yeah, it's it's on top of that. When, yeah, when that's fine. Um, so, yeah, so the team actually can, continued working at LinkedIn for a while. Um, it had open sourced Kafka to, to become Apache Kafka that – a lot of organizations were adopting and, and the team then saw potential to help service Apache Kafka in the enterprise. So they left LinkedIn, um, uh, John Rao, uh, Neha and, and Jay, then kind of the three co-founders set up Confluent in 2014. Um, and uh, the idea then was that they would effectively provide support for Kafka in the enterprise and and build out products that they could see were common requirements. So one, for example, was a monitoring tool to monitor Kafka in the enterprise. So you want some level of kind of monitoring and management when you run Kafka at scale. And, and they kind of built that as a Confluent product. Another was Replicator, because often you have multiple Kafka clusters that you want to replicate data across clusters. So they, they built out a robust enterprise-ready version of that and really started Confluent on those those two products plus providing support for the enterprise Great. Um, in the early days. And, and there was a subscription model. Back then, most enterprises were self-managing Kafka, so they were running it on their own infrastructure, whether it was in, on own data centers or public cloud. They would, they would manage the environment. Uh, and now we have a fully managed version of a confluent platform that's based on Kafka. But um, yeah, back then it was a kind of self-managed support model, mostly. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the, the more operationally um, kind of critical it becomes, the more of an operational burden there is to try and look after what you've just set up as well. So yeah, it kind of sits in there. Exactly that. And, and we see when you manage a kind of enterprise scale production ready system on kind of based on Kafka, there are things that you probably want to do. So I've mentioned the monitoring maintenance and the replicator, but now we, we also see organizations um, that started to build things around a Kafka um, ecosystem. So some, for example, would build a, a self-service portal to, be able to publish to and subscribe from a platform. And, and they would build that themselves because it didn't exist. You couldn't go and buy it. Whereas as, as Confluence worked with many customers, we've started to recognize common patterns. And we're yeah. starting to now build a lot of that, those features and functions into our platform. So the platform is so much more than Kafka now. And actually, we've moved away from talking about Kafka to a, the, the Confluent platform, which is... And I'll give you an example. It includes things like streams governance. So with Confluent Cloud, a fully managed service, you don't have that operational burden of running and managing, maintaining a Kafka environment, but you, you also have things that you would probably want with a, that type of environment. You can look at the catalog of streams, so data as a product. You can look at the lineage of those streams, like where they've come from, and you can ensure the quality of the data on the stream. So lots of challenges that organizations working with data face, they can now kind of buy from Confluent. Yeah, because you've got that privileged position of having done it for so many different use cases and clients, you can see the commonalities and then make it a part of what they can yeah. buy from you. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah. So let's go through some examples, some real use cases then. Like, so you've talked about LinkedIn, and that does make sense a lot because we've all kind of gone on LinkedIn probably, and it's just, I, I can imagine the real-time data. I can imagine the nightmare of trying to keep track of everyone's preferences and where they've been clicking and to be able to feed them the right adverts or whatever. 
Wow, <laughs> mind blowing. How about how about other um, other types of company? Have you got some other examples? Yeah, so I mean the the challenge, but also the opportunity for us is that we can kind of hit almost any any use case or solution that uses data, which of course is kind of almost any business process these days. So uh, you can all apply Kafka and that Confluent platform to almost anything. So it's, we're not. We're, we cross all industry verticals, um, most solutions within any industry vertical. So the challenge is always kind of where do you start? And, and um, the financial services is probably one of our strongest uh, verticals from a uh, business perspective in, in that FS was an early adopter of our technology um, along with the digital first and digital native. So kind of everyone gets like Uber, Netflix, LinkedIn, kind of Airbnb, the, a lot of these organizations are architected around a data in motion platform. Mm. And, and most people kind of get that because they understand that real-time nature. But in more traditional businesses like financial services, the early use cases would include uh, things, kind of things where the banks were struggling with processing huge amounts of data and, and and in a timely fashion. So one area was regulatory reporting. And we, we encountered lots of banks early on in our in the birth of Confluent, a lot of banks struggling with hitting certain regulatory requirements. So um, uh, kind of the risk of getting technicals. Kind of MIFID 2 was a re- requirement to report on trades in real time. It often requires mun- taking data from lots of different sources and munging it together, processing it, and, and reporting to the financial regulatory on what trades have happened. And there's all sorts of reasons why you need to do that, but often that would trip up. If, if there was a special character in a field, the batch process would stall. The batch process may take more than 12 hours, and, and then you into a 24-hour period, and, and then you don't meet, you hit your deadline, and you're reporting requiring well it means you get fined by yeah, the yeah they did have property. actual fines wouldn't they and i guess it's even worse because financial services institutions are they're not going to be that cloud native they've existed for years and years they're going to have quite a messy yeah situation where they've got data in all sorts of places legacy systems complex exactly. yeah exactly that and if mm. you look at the integration architecture diagrams of a lot of these organizations they look that that kind of like the Death Star kind of um, spaghetti herbal mess of in point-to-point integrations where they're, they're struggling to kind of keep up with those regulatory requirements. There's lots of new regulatory requirements coming in. And, and again, the kind of timeline to report on these is becoming shorter and shorter. And the amount of data is increasing significantly, especially as people move from kind of in-bank, in, in kind of... Um, uh, branch interactions, I should say, to, to kind of digital interactions, which increases the number of the, the data significantly. So a lot of banks' systems are creaking and they've got these new regulatory reporting requirements. And and, and it just turns out our architecture is a great way of offloading events as they happen, um, the reports, the trades, the whatever it is that we need to report and we can take that and stream it into a confluent architecture and and then report on that in real time as it happens. It's very easy to then work with that data. It's not impacting core systems of record. It's kind of offloaded from the legacy mainframes and so on. And, and we saw that as an early use case uh, solution for organizations coming and looking at and taking our those data feeds and data points and running it through to simply report on regulatory. So it's kind of quite a simple basic use case, but the money saved from preventing fines would more than pay for that architecture. Yeah, and and, and avoiding having to re-architect anything or I presume the legacy system didn't have any extra workload on it to just send a little bit of data. Well, yeah, and, and, and the beauty is, yeah, there's no rip and replace requirement. Yeah. Um, you run a parallel modern new architecture. And, and it actually offloads um, some in data in some cases, so you, you can mm. run reports. When you report on some mainframe legacy within financial services, you often an old kind of the old licensing terms would work on MIPS, so kind of millions of kind of processing 
and, and the more reads you would do of an environment, the more MIPS to the environment and the more MIPS, the more cost. Mm. I'm actually taking that data and putting it into a streaming architecture that works in real time from all the different data feeds. It not only reduces your need to kind of ETL in batch from that, but you, so you can report in main in all the, those events in real time. You also mm. reduce the MIPS on the mainframes. Yeah. And therefore, the cost savings on that alone can pay for that kind of architecture implementation. Yeah. And, and then on top of that, you can start to build new functionality on the streams of data without hitting the mainframe at all. So modern mobile phone app type technology that the digital first banks first came out with. So, for example, you might expect a notification when you spend something on your card and especially if that goes over a certain limit you might want to block that and, and do a kind of yes or no confirm or, or reject that payment that type of architecture you can start to offload and run in real time off a confluent architecture that you would very, you would very much struggle to do off a traditional main kind of payment system yeah that makes sense so you've you've taken it off the legacy and or at least the workload of um doing the searches on it put it into Confluent, streamed it in, and then you can use that data to build new apps and functionality on top of it. Yeah. Using, yeah. Okay. And, and then maybe over time start to decommission some of the aspects of the old architecture. So, yeah. so there's also kind of maybe a longer term roadmap potential yeah. to, to modernize the your legacy architecture. Okay. That makes sense. And then um, I presume, as you're saying, there's all the verticals. How about retail? Do we, do you... Yeah, and, and again, lots of examples. Do, again, retail struggles with that kind of integration challenge at point to point. So you imagine a kind of financial transaction at point of sale would often trigger notifications to a finance system, but also a supply chain. You might want to update a customer 360 backend database. You might want the kind of omni-channel experience so that that transaction can be done in store, but also online. Um, or they, you may have ordered something online, but pick up in store, and you, you you want all these systems to start to talk to each other and integrate with each other. And again, and again mm-hmm. a lot of retailers are maybe underinvested in IT, and and potentially in some cases hurt during the pandemic when everything went online. Um, we have examples where um, organisations needed to then go fully online with their supply chain that we linked back to manufacturing linked to kind of what's in store i.e what's in inventory inventory management is something quite interesting because again that used to be batch so a store would sell things at the end of the day kind of work out what was in store what was what needed ordering and um in an online world though when someone buys something they expect that to be kind of delivered next day so real-time inventory management has become a really hot kind of use case in retail, yeah. Um, especially where you're doing online ordering and going to pick up in store, um, and, and so on. So yeah, lots of lots of, lots of examples of um, uh, and and some of the biggest retailers in the world are kind of building their backbone architecture on Confluent. So yeah, because the the way that people used to do um, inventory management through to buying and selling and stuff was more on SAP and things. Is that is that still? Yeah, and we're we're seeing a lot of well, SAP is kind of a backbone of many retailers and mm. kind of CG type organisations. We're seeing a lot of integration into SAP, and again, a kind of an offload from SAP to to work with real time app yeah. functionality that organizations may be building on kind of to augment sap so so it's a similar story we're never gonna kind of argue for a rip and replace of no. big kind of core systems of record slash erp type applications running running these businesses but equally a lot of that traditional kind of putting data in a big database kind of static data at rest requiring batch processing on and on, on kind of a daily weekly monthly report basis it, it ju- just doesn't cut it for a lot of the functionality yeah. that customers can expect today so yeah it, it doesn't cut it anymore does it 
And um, what, that talking about that storage of data, I'm imagining a big pipe and a big stream of data. Where does Confluence store much or any of it? We can. So Kafka is, yeah, it's a, we, we talk about setting data in motion and Kafka mm-hmm. is really, I mean, one way of thinking about data is all, all relational databases and the way we've worked with data historically has, has mostly been about kind of taking it and putting it somewhere. Mm-hmm. So we talk about kind of static data in, in databases. Mm. And you might think of a bucket of data, a bucket of water, and, and, yeah. and Kafka may be turning that on its side and turning it into a pipe and working with a flow of data. Mm. Is it one, one way of thinking about it. Um, so instead of querying static data, where the query is active and the data is passive, you start to turn data on its side and the, the data becomes active. And you can still query, but your query is kind of static because it's sitting on active yeah. data. Um, the, um, I guess the, that's, yeah, so Kafka, and I'll, I'll pause there because I, I forget the question. But <laughs> I was talking about how, whether that water is stored at oh, all. So, yeah, the storage, sorry. So the... Um, so with Kafka, we you, you're working with the flow of data, but you can set a retention period. So the retention period can be kind of seconds, mm-hmm. microseconds, minutes, days, weeks, months, or, or infinite retention. And yeah. and with infinite retention, Kafka becomes like in, in a sense a database. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there are pros and cons to doing that. We storage can become expensive. In, in, in data, we we in the Confluent platform we have something called peer storage where we actually take things that are going to be stored for any length of time and put it into a secondary kind of cheaper level of storage. Yeah. So we do see some organisations using Kafka as with infinite storage turned on and and using it as a way of storing and retaining data. There are other ways though of working. We often see organisations working with Kafka in that kind of flow and processing layer. And then taking long-term data and putting it into a, I don't know, Snowflake or or MongoDB type yeah. architecture for, for ongoing retention. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, great. But how about where some of the flows of data are much slower, like, oh, I don't know, some governmental data perhaps, or um... yeah, and and again, the the kind of selling point for Kafka and Confluent platform is is like kind of real time nature, but it's not the only selling point, right? So the other is kind of an ease of integration. This is a, a effectively a publish and subscribe model mm. to data. So any anyone can publish events as they happen or data to the platform, and that goes in flow. And others can subscribe. You can have many subscribers to events as they happen. So we do see. The platform used for slower processes, even things like within a bank, it might like mortgages applications, for example. They, they're not huge scale mm. um, uh, flows, but they are useful to kind of publish an event, uh, someone applying for a mortgage, and that then tends to trigger other things like kind of credit check and a, I don't know a location check on the property, evaluation of the check of the property. You can start to trigger other events as they happen which can then also trigger it so you can start to automate a process that even at low volume doesn't have to be super kind of millisecond latency is um uh and you mentioned government so we are seeing um, governments are obviously kind of collect huge amounts of data and have traditionally worked with static data in big databases that aren't necessarily integrated with each other so um, the NHS and HMRC and, I don't know, kind of welfare, the, all these different ways of working with data would potentially benefit by integrating with each other. So you could have a kind of common um, uh, schema or kind of common view of a customer. I talk about a customer, but a citizen in this sense in, the, in government. But you, you could start to potentially build a cost citizen 360 view and offer a better service as a government yeah. um, by integrating systems and we're, we're having some interesting conversations with kind of various governments around the world on on that but 
Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of challenges along sharing data across the different areas and what you can, but also when you when you know you can, it's a better service for that one person who's crossing into school and to the benefit system and then off into yeah needing their national insurance number and everything. You know, there's only yeah. one person, so it's better joined up thing, especially now we're all used to Amazon and other sort of exactly, yeah. services. Yeah. The Norwegian yeah. government were doing something very interesting using Kafka and, and Confluent platform around um, that website type experience. So as a you you may go onto the government citizen website and based on what you were searching for, the site could predict that potentially you, I don't know, you were about to become a new father, that you might be interested in child benefit and time off paternity leave, that you might want this aspect of um, hospital care for your child and, and start to serve kind of predictive, targeted, contextual information uh, that was totally relevant and, and personalised to you, uh, but kind of based on your browsing patterns of a, of a website so much like kind of how linkedin might have used kafka back in the day yeah wow um, oh always really so forward thinking <laughs> kind of integration to back end of your employment history your tax yeah. history who you are the, and and again if, if that's op- kind of open but secure um uh and, and personalized to you there's there's a huge amount of value in in kind of managing man- your journey and and that actually the guys in the Norwegian government in NAV, the organization, were, were great presenters and they used to talk about kind of life being just a, a journey of events and it's, it's a, a serious emotion of kind of through life and you, you want a platform that works with data in motion that responds to those events as and when they happen. Mm, yeah. and, and that's a much better way of architecting systems than the traditional way of taking data and putting it in a database and querying it. And, and it and it quickly goes out of date. Right? You you move house, your address changes. You overwrite that in a traditional database. You overwrite your address, so you kind of lose the fact that you've had five addresses. And, um, whereas a, a, a streaming platform is a much more suitable way of architecting solutions around it. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. I think I think that if I was new to this sort of concept, I'll have had quite a few examples of how you can um, kind of apply it. So you're thinking of spaghetti kind of integrations or real-time lifetime events um, or, you know, flow of events mm. is, is kind of the things that have to trigger. So I suppose for next steps, really, if anyone's interested in, in how that can apply in your own world, in your own kind of environment, can, can people reach out to you, Lyndon? to just um, yeah, find out more? So, yeah, I, I can be contacted on uh, on LinkedIn or lyndon at confluent.io. Uh, okay. And equally, you can reach out to Confluent Sales. And, but I'm more than happy to have a conversation with organizations looking at implementing this technology and how they get the most value out of it. Yeah, and, and that's where Summerford fits in as well because we tend to do the put people in touch with the par- partners that we have um, and you can buy them through us but sort of a no pressure kind of a discussion of is this even right for you right now we can help with that too so yeah thank you so much for spending the time to talk to us yeah we thank really, you really appreciate yeah, it thanks for the opportunity thank, thanks for the audience for listening yeah you've made it kind of clearer which is great because you can see all the words on the on the um the websites or you can understand in theory but actually just to talk through some of those tangible examples is is really invaluable thanks so much right thanks again